about, I'm going to show you a blueprint, hello, welcome, for scaling up your brokerage. I'm going to show you how to take your existing brokerage, if you have one, or starting a new one, and scale it for growth and profitability. So who's excited and who's ready to learn about profit? Woohoo! Yay! All right, come on in. So we're going to learn about how to build capacity to grow your brokerage. So welcome everybody and thank you to Triple Play for having me out today. I went back to college to get my bachelor's degree in real estate, which I finished uh, a couple years ago, and then after that I went ahead and went for my MBA degree, which I graduated last year. During, during the process, I learned a lot of great Fortune 500 concepts of why the big corporations are so successful. And me, I've only been a little mom and pop shop brokerage owner for 26 years, licensed for 30, and I always wondered how the big guys do it how the big companies make money, and why can't I do the same thing in my brokerage. So that was why I went back to school and I learned a lot of really great concepts. I'll be sharing those with you here today. So today you get, in one hour, compacted down, Fortune 500 concepts without the MBA price tag. How awesome is that, right? Okay. A little bit about me, I think I, I talked a little bit about it, but I'm also a brokerage owner of California Coast Country Homes, an independent boutique brokerage, obviously in California. And my mission is to raise or elevate the industry standards and professionalism. And I know that all of you have that same goal, and that's why you're here today. So, so scaling up begins with a foundation. One of the reasons that I could never grow my brokerage big is because I wasn't prepared for it. So here, this is my little illustration. Now, how many of us enjoy watching the HGTV show about tiny homes, right? Okay, yeah, the tiny homes. I thought, I wonder how they did it. Well, you know what they build their houses on? They build them on a little tiny platform with wheels like a little truck, right? Um, even smaller than an RV in most cases. That's how they get the tiny home. <coughs> it begins with the foundation. Now, if somebody had a tiny home and they said, oh, I want to build the Empire State Building, can they do it? No, because they started with a too small of a foundation. So if you want to build an empire, that's what we're going to show you today, you start with a big foundation. You dig it deep, dig it wide, and build the infrastructure that's ready for the growth. We can't have massive growth if we're at a small level, if we're thinking small, if we're only prepared for small. Now, it's not, not really true that we can't grow because, you know, what if we are a small brokerage and all of a sudden we get 150 agents wanting to join? We can grow, but it's not the right kind of growth. It's not going to be successful and it's not going to be sustainable over the long term, right? So in today's agenda, I'll go over with you the vision and exit strategy. And this is sort of the order uh, of the class, business plan, your financials, profit center, agent recruiting, strategic plan, operations management, and innovation. So we're going to crunch a lot into a little bit of time today. And everybody should have a workbook. Please raise your hand if you don't have a workbook. Okay, one person. Carl, can we need one workbook up here? Um, I have 50 workbooks, so after that I do have a one-page handout for people uh, who come after the 50. Sir, can you raise your hand again? Okay, right up here. not a strategy. I know it seems kind of funny, but how many of us wish and hope and dream of a better life? And it's great to wish and hope and dream, but honestly, that's not a strategy for growing a brokerage. Today, we're going to show you a business model. It's based on the strategic pillars that you see here. We talked about that already. That's going to be the agenda. And the basic bottom line for all of this is your vision, mission, and your core values. So that's the beginning point. Sometimes it, it may be easy to say, 
oh, well, I'm just going to start recruiting a bunch of agents. That's how I'm going to grow my brokerage. But then you have no plan of how to recruit the agents. You have no plan of what it's going to grow into or how you're going to retain those agents, right, the long-term growth and sustainability. So what is a measure of success for a real estate brokerage? Is it profit? How much money you make? Is it the impact, the services you provide to clients? Is it your leadership reach and the legacy you're, gonna, you're going to leave? Or is it what you contribute to your community? And uh, all of the above. Okay, good answer. I love that. Yeah, I, I believe it's all of the above, too. It is about profit. Profit's the bottom line. Without a profit, we don't even have a brokerage. Without a profit, we just have an expensive hobby, right? So we are in this business to make money. But money is not the only thing because we want to offer a great service that we feel good about, that uh, at the end of the day we can leave a legacy. We want to train others to come behind us. We want to be able to contribute to the community and make a great impact as well. Uh, I just want to comment a little bit on this, the profit. Can you replace your CEO's salary with a job? So that is a question that I get sometimes from brokerage owners. Is, how much profit should I be making? You know, what's the minimum amount? Of course, we don't talk about a maximum amount because it's unlimited, but what's the minimum amount that I should be making as a brokerage owner? And the answer to that is, how much would you be making if you were working at a job? So say, for example, I, I didn't own my brokerage and I went out and got a job somewhere. And at my job, I was making, say, 5,000 a month, 60,000 a year, Plus, I have some fringe benefits, that'd be 10000 So now I'm making 70000 a year. If I didn't own my brokerage, I went out and got a job. So should my brokerage be making me at least a $70,000 a year salary, right? Okay? Well, maybe not the first year, but <laughs> that's a good goal. It might not happen the first year, but okay? So that's how you measure profitability. Um, that's a start because Actually, you want to have your brokerage make a profit and you want to have a salary for yourself. So after you pay yourself a salary, you have a, a profit on top of that. So if, if you're co going to work every day in your brokerage, and, and I, I do see this happening um, fairly often with us mom and pop shops, is we depend on our own personal sales to support the brokerage. And basically what happens is we're paying the agents to come work for us. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't they be paying us and supporting us so we can have a nice vacation while, and we're on vacationing while they're paying for it because they're making sales and transactions? So make sure that we have the priorities straight in our brokerage that we're not there to support the office so other people can come in and work. They're coming to work to support the profitability of the company. And when you come from the mindset of profitability, it changes. You can flip your, the, model, the business model, okay? So begin with the end. Our goal is to build a profitable corporation. At the end, you might want to sell your brokerage for top dollar, earn some money, or you might want to retire and have some passive income or both. You might have uh, children or agents that you really like that you plan to pass your brokerage along to? If so, that's great. Okay, But the goal is you need to have an end in your mind before you start. Because if you don't have an end, what are you really working towards? Are you just working every day spinning your wheels? Or do you have a goal? And once you have that end established, you can see the end usually has some profit in it, right? And that profit means that you are going to have to get to a place of profitability to be able to sell your brokerage or even to give it away to somebody. You know, if I want my children to have my brokerage later, I need to build something of value that's going to make them want to work there instead of going and getting another job. So it's all about profitability and building the value, right? Okay, any questions? Okay, we have a small group here today so we can be a little more interactive. So start by envisioning your ideal company. What kind of organization do you want to have? How big do you want to grow it? And then the three building blocks we talked about before. Now, most of us in here were already brokerage owners, and that's okay. So I, I, 
because I, I was thinking of starting, you know, when you're starting, you think of, okay, I'm not a brokerage owner yet. I'm going to start one. Here's why I need to start. But actually, it's okay to start over again, to revamp your brokerage, to start from scratch, to say, here's where I'm at, but you know what? I really want to do something new and different. I want to make a big impact. What do I do? I'm going to start with a clean slate and write a business plan from scratch. Okay. So your, I, I call this the achievement pyramid. As I said, your vision, your mission, and your values are the basis for everything in your brokerage. How can you even go out and hire agents if you don't know what the mission of your company is? How can they come in line with your values and support your mission if they don't know? They're just lost because you're lost. So you have to have a good foundation to support bringing on agents. Otherwise, agents aren't going to be attracted to your company. Or if they come, they're not going to know why they're there and they'll leave shortly after. Your goals and objectives are based on your vision, mission, and values. And so are your best business practices. And then at the top of the pyramid is us. That's our service leadership. How do we lead? We lead based on the vision, mission, and values that we put together and our goals and how we have formulated our business plan. Okay. Would you agree that a goal without a plan is just a wish? I call it a fantasy, right? A lot of people have these big goals and we go to those hype seminars, they teach you, wow, have a big goal. Well, a goal is great, but if you don't have a way to get there, right, it's a little frustrating. So the, it's great to have a goal, start with that, but then make some steps to get there. Get there one by one so that you can make sure that you have a plan and you know when you're there or when you're on the right track. So, questions? Yes? Okay, I, yes, if you do have the book, I am on page. Let me see here. Well, we're at the part for a business plan now. Yeah, so page. Page three. Yeah, so step one is your vision and exit strategy. And you can work on this now, but honestly, this is going to take a little bit of thought. So I would suggest taking this home with you, working on it. I know we go to conventions and we hear so much great information, and then we go back to the office and guess what? Work is piled up and we've got to get to work. But I would encourage you when you go back to your office to take some time for yourself and work on your business instead of in your business. Okay? So, so, yeah, so business plan. How many of us have a business plan A? It's written out, it's 100% complete, woohoo! How many are B? It's in the process of being written, which is good too. Or how many say C? I don't have a business plan yet, but I'd like to get started. Okay, so A's, how many A's do we have? Yay! Okay, those are my high achiever, right? My overambitious people like me. <laughs> B, it's in the process of being written, which is great. Okay, uh, that's almost everybody. Great. And C, not yet, but I'm going to get started. And you see, okay, awesome, great. Thanks for being here today. You're in the right place. So the purpose of a, bit, a business plan is to have a clear vision or a blueprint that gives you guidance and direction. It's a, a form of accountability that helps you measure your progress and know how far am I to, from reaching my goals. What do I still have left to do? How much have I done so far to get where I need to go? Also, when you bring on partners to the company, which you may do in the future, don't you think they're going to want to see a business plan for your company? Right? And don't you think that if you sell the company, they're going to want to see a business plan? Right? How many of us watch Shark Tank? Woohoo! My favorite show. Okay, Shark Tank and what other one? The Profit. Right? So we learned that a business is valued by its profit. And they'll say, you know, for example, okay, take your net profit, multiply it times five, and that's how much your business is worth, or multiply it times three, or whatever they're uh, working on, right? So obviously we want to have a business plan that leads to that profit to make our company valuable. What about if you want to get funding? Say you want to bring on investors, venture capitalists, angel funding, or you know, just have, want to go to a bank and get a loan. Don't you need to present a business plan? Absolutely. What about if you have a new idea and you want to see if it's feasible? Is it going to work or not? 
the last se session we just had was about uh, be the boss and dominate your market. We talked about creating new innovative uh, spaces in the market. Is it going to work? I don't know. Let's crunch the numbers and see. So that's why you need the business plan. Okay, so there at the bottom of page three, you're going to see the SWOT matrix. How many of us are already familiar with the SWOT? Okay, oh, it's just about everybody. Okay, great. So SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And internally, you have strengths and weaknesses as a person. And when you're first starting out your brokerage, your brokerage strengths and weaknesses are yours, right? But as you grow your brokerage, you bring on key players, you bring on a team, and you start to create proprietary services and systems, now your brokerage can stand alone on its own strengths and weaknesses. Now externally, that means in the market, there are opportunities and threats. How many of us are aware that there are some new companies coming into the real estate space? Huge, multi-million dollar, billion dollars of funding companies that some of us are worried about or afraid of. Right? We've always seen those coming into the market space. Those could either represent an opportunity or a threat. Would you agree? It depends on how you decide to innovate your business. Is that huge player going to be something that I take advantage of and use it as an opportunity to leverage my business and grow? Or am I afraid of it? Is it a threat that I want to minimize or get rid of or avoid. Okay. So there are a lot of things in the market really quickly. Strengths are resources and capabilities that we leverage to advance the company. Weaknesses are things that constrain the company. We want to minimize those. Opportunities allow us to achieve the company's vision and we want to capitalize on those. Whereas threats, we want to neutralize those because those are inhibiting the company from growing. Okay, so what are core competencies? We just talked about strengths. Core competencies are your strengths, resources, and capabilities that you have, that your brokerage has, that you do different or better than your competitors. Now, how many of us are aware this is a very competitive market, right? In the last session, we just talked about the, the red ocean with the sharks circling, and that's the real estate market because there are there is more supply of real estate agents then there is demand for services and that creates an ultra competitive environment. So when you have core competencies, it's something that you do differently or unique from your competitors that allows you to stand out and to grab that, um, you know, a little niche in your marketplace of your customers. So you can, they're distinctive competencies. All right, now we're going on to the next step, which is your pro forma. That is your cash flow statement. That is your balance sheet, your profit and loss, which we refer to as the income statement in accounting. And your revenue sources, such as your sales projections and your ratios. These are all things that you need to include in your business plan. Now, how many of us use QuickBooks or some other accounting? Okay. QuickBooks is so cool, you just click a button and there's all your information for you, right? But it's also important to know, not just to look at it, but to know year over year, quarter over quarter, and month over month. Because that gives you your direction. If you're just looking at a, a, an income statement, you think, wow, we made a lot of money, but did you really? Let's look at what we did last year and the year before, and let's look at the overall trend. because your direction determines your destination, right? So in an income statement, we have revenues and costs. We have the key figures, our key gross revenue, gross income, net income, profit margin, and then we hear about that good old EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And then we have fixed and variable expenses too. So I'm gonna show you an example um, probably most of you are familiar with it. I just want to talk a little bit about maximizing profit and looking at your income statement a little closer. So the income statement I'm going to show you is not a real income statement from any business. They're just fictitious numbers that I created for the purposes of illustration. So I don't offer any financial advice. Talk to your CPA or accountant or tax preparer for that, okay? 
All right, so here we have a brokerage income statement. At the top, we have the sales, the revenue. We have sales transactions, referral fees, property management, <coughs> agent fees such as desk fees, transaction management fees, consulting fees, BPO fees, and you can have other things in there. That's just an example. So this company, we said they made a million dollars, which, you know, probably not a lot, but um, we're, just, we're using round numbers for illustration purposes. And then they had cost of sales. Their cost of sales were co-op buyer brokers, agent splits, referral fees, TC fees, and that took 90% off the top. Now this is a brokerage that is probably either doing a little flat fees or very, very um, high commission split to the agents. And we see that a lot of times. Some of us might be doing that as well. I offer um, a low flat fee to my, in my brokerage. And so that makes the gross margin very tiny. In this example, we have a 10% gross margin, right? So think about that when you're planning your business. If you want to say, oh, we offer you know, a 90 10 split to our agents, then you have to think about, well, what does that mean for me as a brokerage owner? We get 10%. Now we have to pay all of our bills from that or we have to create additional revenue sources because that's not going to support our overhead. So next we have our operating expenses. Oh, the cost of sold, those are the variable expenses because they vary depending on the business itself, uh, depending on the transaction. So every transaction you close, you have an expense associated with that transaction. That's your variable. Then you have your operating expenses, which are your fixed costs. By the way, yours might not be set up this way in QuickBooks. If you're just using QuickBooks off the shelf, it does not look like this. I actually created these categories um, in my QuickBooks, so I would be able to read this the way that I need to read it to make sense of it, okay? So you, you can go into QuickBooks and you can personalize um, all the categories so that it's more meaningful to you as a brokerage owner, okay? So then we have our operating expenses. That's the manager's salary plus benefits. That's my salary, right? I don't want to get paid. Staff salary, building lease, equipment lease, utilities, maintenance, marketing for recruitment, training for retention, tech tools, office supplies, insurance, professional fees, risk management. So that's all in there. And then I have a net profit or EBITDA of you know, 3.5% as a net margin. So does that seem like a big number or a small number? I would say it's pretty small. So, so our goal as a brokerage owner, we said at the beginning, is profitability is to maximize profits. So you maximize profits by doing two things. And uh, the first thing you want to do is increase the sales and increase the gross margin, increase, which increases the gross margin and the net profit. And then the second thing you want to do is you want to lower your cost of sales, your variable expenses, and lower the fixed costs. So by raising the income, lowering the expenses, it actually leads to increased profitability. Now it may seem like common sense, but by breaking it down into the categories and analyzing it and looking at year over year trends, you can see, oh, this is what we are doing right, or this is what we need to improve, okay? So on your balance sheet, uh, as we know, assets are good, liabilities are bad, equity is great, right? And both sides of the balance. So this is a little, this is, this is not really a real balance sheet. This is just kind of what goes in that category. You guys have all seen that before. So let's talk about the cash flow statement. That tracks the flow of money. It's not necessarily correlated with income. Some of us, we go into QuickBooks, we print it out, and we're really not sure what the cash flow statement means or how to use it. But what you should do with it is use it to spot danger signs and red flags by comparing dollar amounts in year over year percentages. And that takes a little more work. It's not just as simple as printing it out, but you have to compare it year over year. That's how you realize the direction that you're going in. Okay, so briefly a little bit about budget versus forecast. So budget is an estimate of the expectation of the revenues that you're going to have, whereas a forecast rev it estimates where you actually are going. So an example is, say you have a business plan. In your business plan, you have a pro forma. Your pro forma shows you're going to make you know, a gazillion dollars this year. Woo, yay. And that's your budget. But then 
you look at your finances and you say, well, according to our finances, if we continue following this trend, at the end of the year, we won't have made a gazillion, we'll only made a half a gazillion, right? So that's the difference there. And then there's top ratios that you're going to want to use in your company as well. So um, we already talked about this, but how many use QuickBooks? How many use Excel? Okay, Microsoft. So how many use something else besides like that? Use what? Quicken. Okay. Okay. So one of the books that I do recommend, I'm sort of, I guess you could call a bookaholic. I love reading great books. And I have this book. It's called Profit First. I recommend this for brokerage owners. It talks about paying your taxes and putting cash in separate envelopes sort of concept, which is, oh, it's time to pay taxes. What happened to all my money? Oh, it's time to pay my salary. What, where's the, all the money at? So this helps you take the money and distribute it as it comes in in the right category so you don't go out and spend it on frivolous things or new marketing ideas or that shiny new penny that comes along and that you have money for the correct categories uh, and to make sure that you have those expenses paid up front and of course pay your salary up front too. And okay let's talk about bank accounts and if we're following this format for profit first what he recommends, the book author, is to have a business account. By the way, we all have a separate client trust account, right? That doesn't interfere with or touch our business account. That's why it's separate. So in our business account, you want to have an account for your income. Then you take your income that you, you every month you have expenses you have to pay. You put that right amount, the correct amount, into this account and pay your expenses. You have taxes, quarterly. We pay our quarterly, so you put that in that account. You put your payroll in a different account. Who's the most important person on payroll? You are. You want to make sure you're earning a salary. And then you put, you know, if you do donations, charity, in a different account. So you see how you can sort of compartmentalize this so it's not all on one account and you're not wondering where did the money go at the end of the month when you have bills to pay and it's not there. So always hire professionals, bookkeeper, accountant, CPA, tax preparer, enrolled agent. They will help guide you. Um, one topic I do want to talk about is break-even point. Now, those of us who have taken accounting, we know that the break-even point is something that we calculate, and in business we calculate that too. So I would really encourage you not to think in terms of a break-even point. I would encourage you to think in terms of profitability. Because if, you know, we get this all the time. I get emails every day from vendors who want to sell me stuff. And they say, oh, just, you know, use our great lead management system and close three transactions and you can break even. No, I don't want to break even, sorry. <laughs> I want to make a profit. Show me how I can make a profit, not break even. So I just want to get us that, you know, out of that mindset of the break even mindset. Now, when we're scaling up our company, one of the things we need to think about is how fast do we want to scale? How fast do we want to grow? Um, because there is a trade-off. Wouldn't you agree that if somebody gave you a million dollars and said, hey, go invest it in your company, you could grow really fast, right? You could have tons of marketing, hire a lot of agents, you could have buildings all over the city, you could go to expand to another state, but the money comes at a cost, doesn't it? So there's a trade-off there. It's, do you want to be debt-free? Now, I should back up a little bit. The money can come to you in terms of a loan, which means it's a debt you have to pay back with interest, it's a liability on your balance sheet, or it can come in terms of, say you have an investor. That investor gives you some money. What happens then? Well, now you're accountable to that investor. They probably take a piece of your revenue. They take a piece of your uh, ownership because they want to be a co-owner. So that's a trade-off. Do you want to grow fast? Are you willing to trade that? Or do you want to be rapid growth, or do you want to be debt-free and grow slower and more organic as you scale up? But the bottom line is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? That's from Alice in Wonderland, for those of you that remember that. So if we don't have a plan, we don't know where we're going, then it doesn't matter which direction we're going in, because we don't have a destination. So in our real estate business industry, we have cycles. 
We have seasons, but we also have cycles. Now, how many of us were around 10 years ago through that cycle? And we survived, and we're still here. Woo-hoo! Okay, high five across the room to everybody. Woo-hoo! <laughs> yeah, I survived. It was very, very tough. We might have something like that coming again. It might be just as bad. We don't know. None of us can predict the future, but we do know that it will never stay the same. We do know that real estate goes up and down and up and down. And right now, it's a pretty good market, right, in most places. Do we think it's going to continue forever? <laughs> Probably not. So we need to be ready. So one of the things you want to do is um, to protect your business from the ups and downs is to have a comprehensive business plan that prepares for different types of markets. And another thing you want to do is ensure your overhead is covered every month. If you're relying on your agents to go out and sell stuff or yourself to go out and sell and transactions to close, you're at the mercy of buyers and sellers and lenders in the marketplace and co-op agents. And there might be some uneasiness, some sleepless nights of wondering, are we going to pay our rent this month in the office? Are we going to keep the utilities turned on? Are we going to keep those tool, tech tools open for our agents? So I have a little tip. And uh, when I first started in real estate, I worked for a top selling real estate agent. She brought me under her wing and mentored me. And she actually had a property management company, a small company, maybe like 20 units. And so what she did, her business model was most of her clients were real estate investors who were friends of hers. They were professors and worked at the local university. Their accountant told them, hey, you're, 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 you're paying too much in taxes. You need to invest in real estate. Go see my friend. And so they went and saw her, and she would help them. So she'd help them buy investment property. So cha-ching, we've got one uh, income source. And then she said, guess what? I can manage that for you too. So then we have property management. That's revenue every single month, right? Income every month. That's a net profit. Now, how many of us already do property management? You, okay. Wouldn't you agree it's a pain? <laughs> I call it adult babysitting. <laughs> okay, it's a pain, but you know what? Every single month, my overhead is covered. And I write myself the check. How's that? Right? From the fifth of every month. So there are pros and cons, but I strongly suggest having more than one component to your business to make sure you can weather these storms. Be ready for that eventual sales downturn. We know it's coming. Are we prepared by having multiple types of revenue sources that support different markets. Okay, this is just what we said. We have seasonal annual cycles, short-term and long-term economic cycles. So how do you prepare for these market cycles? Do you A, counterbalance your income sources, B, lower debt and raise profitability, that's what we just talked about a minute ago, or C, run and hide under the covers? <laughs> now if you pick C, there's no judgment in here. Some days I feel like doing that too, right? Uh, especially, uh, you know, when we had our last downturn. But So how many would say, A, counterbalancing income sources is how you plan to counteract and prepare for the market cycles? Okay, great. How many say, B, you're going to work on lowering your debt and raising your profitability? Okay, that's a great. How many say, C, run and hide under the covers? <laughs> She's pointing to something, okay? Nobody will admit it, but if you do, that's okay, too, because um, when you're done, you still got to come out and then go back to A or B, right? Okay, so let's talk about counterbalancing our income sources. Now, right now, we're in a bit of an up market, and we have sales. We have agents who are going out and, and closing transactions, so that's an up market product. What do we do when the market goes down? Do we have any down market products? Who can think of something that you might want to do? Yes? Short sales. All right, short sale, distressed properties. Are you starting to build up a book of that? Do you have your business plan ready for that? Um, what else besides short sales? Exactly, bank-owned properties, REOs. Okay, are you working on building up so you can be positioned to get some of those accounts in a in a down market? 
Um, there might be other sort of revenue sources too. I think we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So you want to have uh, a balance of products and services that fit all types of market. So when one goes down, no worries, the other one will go up. One thing that I did notice, I just talked about property management, but in the last downturn, people that had to leave their homes, they all became renters. Wouldn't it be great to capture that market? And then wouldn't it be great to capture those you know, people and put them in your pipeline, help them work on their credit, get past the foreclosures and bankruptcies and buy again in two to three years? Isn't that great to have a pipeline of business? Who's still going to be in business two or three years from now? Okay, so let's put those people in the pipeline. Two or three years, now we have some business we can bank on. What about investing in new products? Before you do that, research and compare. Decide what is the best use of your funds and make sure that you are comparing product to product and a product versus doing nothing. As I said, I get a lot of people who say, oh, we, we, wanna, uh, we want you to buy our product. We can help you make more money. So you only have to invest, you know, say $5,000. So as a broker, Joni, you're going to sit down and say, okay, I have $5,000 to invest. What if I invest in here? And what if I choose to invest in a different company doing something else? What is my return on investment? And that allows you to weigh both choices. Here's another choice. What if I invest it in there versus what if I do nothing? Okay. Would I be more profitable if I actually took the $5,000 and did not invest it at all. So before you uh, think about that, weigh both sides, do the finances. Steve Forbes, I was uh, blessed to be able to go to um, a thought leadership conference earlier this year. He was there, and one of the key points he said was, wealth is never idle. We never have money sitting around us not being used. You might think it's not being used if it's in your bank account, but if it's in your bank account, it's being used, but not by you, okay? because the bank is paying you money on that or paying you interest because they are using your money. So take your capital, put it to work, earn some profitability, leverage it, maximize your profits. Now we're going to talk about the next one, which is profit centers. Um, we just talked about having multiple streams of revenue. There are a lot of different ways you can make profits in this business. I don't want you to get overwhelmed with thinking of a hundred different ways. But I do want you to start thinking outside the box and think a little more creatively and not thinking about just the traditional sales model that we've always done. Because I can tell you there are some changes coming in the market. There are some changes coming to the real estate industry. Are you going to be positioned to be able to take advantage of those and leverage those? Or are you going to just see the market pass you by and wish that you would have worked on your business instead of in your business. Okay. So here's some examples. Property management, mortgage lending, escrow division. I don't think you have escrow here, right? We have that in California. We have closing attorneys here. But there might be a way that you can uh, look at a profit center for that. Home warranties, commercial leasing and sales. How many of us do commercial? That's a great market to get into because it doesn't follow the residential market. The residential market might be down and the commercial market might be up. As a matter of fact, in the last downturn, it took the commercial market a good three to five years after the residential market um, went down before it changed. So that could be a, a good way to sort of build your company on a strong foundation to scale up. Home improvement. How many of your sellers want home improvement done before they sell their house? Right? A lot. Have you thought about partnering or offering that in your company? How many of our buyers want to look at a house? Right, we watch HGTV, see the Property Brothers. They want to go buy a house, but they don't want it in its current condition. They want it fixed up. They don't know where to get started. They don't have any help, resources, capital. Is that something that you can provide? And differentiate yourself from the competition because you have a home improvement aspect or, or you know, building aspect or renovation aspect or even providing them the capital to help with that. So another thing is to see, think about converting costs into profit centers. What is the biggest cost most of us have? An office. How can you convert that into a profit center? Maybe rent out a room or an office to a mortgage lender, right? And then you have an in-house mortgage rep. 
um, your agent. You pay for a lot of tech tools for them, right? You offer them this and that, and they're so excited because you have tons of tech tools for them. Does that cost you money? Absolutely. How can you turn that cost center into a profit center? Can you charge them a monthly technology fee, a marketing fee, right? So think about how you can flip it around. What about going out and getting some corporate accounts? Now, agents can't do this. This is up to us brokerages on a brokerage level. What about working with estate attorneys and getting an account where they refer to you all of their probate and estate customers as a, as a source of business? Wouldn't that be great? What about working with a financial planner very closely? You recommend people to them, they recommend people to you. Okay. Some of you may know Saul Klein. Um, he's definitely a, 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 one of the great thought leaders of our industry. And one of the things he did in his business is he went out and got licensed to be able to do tax pre preparation. Because what do people need when they do tax prep? They need to invest in real estate they're paying too much taxes, right? And people that invest in real estate, they need somebody to do their taxes. So he was able to grow his business by looking at other sources of income that were complementary. What about government contracts? Has anybody ever explored that before? Nobody raised their hand in their room. What does that mean? There's no opportunity. Thank you, Rebecca. There's no competition because no other brokerage is going out and getting government contracts. Uh, REO contracts, thank you, we talked about that. Employer assisted housing, that's a class taught by NAR, EAH class. Employer assisted housing teaches you how to go into the workplace and build your footprint in the workplace to become the real estate brokerage of choice for all the agents, for, sorry, for all the employees that work at that company. Wouldn't that be a great source of revenue, a great income stream? Okay, what else do we have on here? Corporate relocation. Big companies relocate their employees all the time. Wouldn't you like to be the agent or the brokerage that they refer to? National referrals, business alliances. These are all things that you can think of sort of outside the box. Think of how you can build your revenue sources. So let's talk about your brokerage. How many revenue sources do you have? Only one, two, or multiple sources? So A is only one. How many have one? Okay, a few. How many have two? How many have more? Okay, great. So it's kind of a third, a third, a third. So hopefully I've given you something to think about, right? Let's talk about customer demand. Who are our customers? A few of you were here for my last session. Who are your customers as a brokerage owner? Agents, those are your customers. Those are your primary customers. Who are your secondary customers? The buyers and sellers, right? So what products and services do your customers need and are they willing to pay for it and can they afford it? So when you talked about um, you know, splits, you're offering them a, a, a high split, but is that all they want? What else do they need? Um, okay, here's different revenue types. I want to talk for a minute. I want to stand on this just a little bit because, you know, agents sometimes um, don't always know what they need. Isn't that true? Or what they want. I can say the biggest pain point for agents, and this is just based on my experience. I am also an admin for um, some big uh, real estate groups on Facebook. Some of you know me from there. Yay, lab coats. <laughs> um, but how many of us know that agents want more than anything a steady stream of business, right? That is the number one reason I would say why agents go out of business and hang up their license is they just can't make it into a business where they continue to produce and get paid every single month. Can you as a brokerage help with that? Can you eliminate their biggest pain point and if so, can you make more profit? Can, can you provide them with a source of leads or can you provide a lead generation system that allows them to close transactions every single month like clockwork? And if you can, it costs you more, right? We talked about profitability, so you're going to pass it on at a cost to help you make a profit instead of 
not profit. Okay. So just food for thought. By the way, the other two sources, uh, the other two pain points for agents, one is unsteady income. Number two is uncertainty of income, right? That deal blows up at the last minute or they don't even know where their next um, transaction is going to come from. And number three is health insurance. Can you be innovative and find a way to help them with that? If so, you're going to have loyal agents for life. So the revenue types are transactional, recurring, transactional, regular, recurring, passive, residual, corporate accounts, subsidiaries, and affiliate partnerships. We talked about all these income sources. There should be a place in there, I believe, where you can sort of write out some of your ideas and your thoughts as you take this back to your offices. And there's also what we call the profit pinwheel that allows you to um, sort of start your, your, your mind thinking as to what you can offer as foundational revenue sources for your company. And also vertical integration, which is, um, so think about where people come, like buyers and sellers, for example. Let's think about where they come from before they get to you. Who do they usually go see? A mortgage lender. Is, and then the mortgage lender may refer them to you or they may not. Is there a way you can bring that service in-house, right, so that you capture more of that? Where else do you get these, from, these buyers and sellers from? Lead sources. Are you paying for outside lead sources? If you are, is there a way you can bring that in-house and you can control more of that supply chain instead of having that be left to chance. Now, what that is, and then also form alliances. Industry partnerships, revenue or profit sharing with complementary businesses. Think about what other financial products and services your customers need. Maybe you deal with a lot of investors. Investors need bookkeeping, they need tax prep, they need asset protection, they need attorney services, they need estate planning. Can you partner and bring those services in-house or form an alliance where you are recommending people and they're recommending you back with this profession? That's a great way to increase your client base across the board. So what you want to do is attract the best agents, target the top producers and those who fit into the culture network to build your sphere and follow up. Find newbies. What are newbies? New agents. New agents who are not yet licensed. Thank you, Phil. And if you can't find them, go out and produce them. Go out and find some non-agents and get them to go to real estate school and, and, and bring them into your company. And then it's a continuous cycle of recruiting, onboarding, retaining, and then promoting them within your company, right? Okay, picture, <laughs> go ahead. To attract the best agents, wouldn't you agree that you need to have a culture that brings them in, right? An attractive culture that they come in and they stay. So what would you say is your company's culture rating? How do you rate in each of these areas? Teamwork, caring, entrepreneurial spirit, collaborative atmosphere, positive energy, go-getter attitude, competitive atmosphere. So it's up to you to decide what the values are in your company and make sure your culture reflects that. Culture is a very, very important piece in retaining agents. Well, first we should say it's recruiting, but also in retaining agents. But the most important thing, I think, is to start by building business friendships with people whom you value, people that have the same mission as you, uh, agents that may be top producers or they may not be top producers but you see their value you recognize what they have to offer and you can train them you can mold them groom them and i call that the diamond in the rough right who wants to find that next top producer at another company or create it as a that person as a newbie and they don't even know they're capable of being a top producer and you mentored them the whole way isn't that the best feeling in the world so the way I start with um, recruiting for agents is keeping a hot list. There uh, should be in the very back of your book, I think, there's like a list you can put down. I put down my top 30 agents that I want to recruit. I look in the MLS, 
Or you could also have, there's a few different services that you can subscribe to. They charge you a monthly fee. They send you all the data on the agents and their market and their production. Now, if uh, that's one of the values of your company, you want to produce, you know, recruit high producers, or if the value in your company is other things, maybe you want to recruit based on that. But this allows you to find and identify those people um, and add them to your drip campaign. Now, when we were real estate agents, we were thinking 24-7 about what? Buyers and sellers. Go back. Buyers and sellers and how to get buyers and sellers in the pipeline. Now, we take off our agent hat, we put on our broker hat. Now, what are we thinking of? Agents, 24-7, 365, how to recruit agents. So it's a little mind shift, mind shift that we have to stop thinking about buyers and sellers focused on agents. And what do the big companies do? They have recruiting events every month. They have a career night. Why do they have events? Because events drive people to you. Events extend your reach. Have something fun. It allows people to be attracted to your culture and they get excited and it's an opportunity to contact people and tell about great things happening in your marketplace. Opportunity to reach out to agents or people that you're hoping will become agents eventually. So do this consistently and persistently. Just like with buyers, you held a first time home buyer workshop every month. Now you're a brokerage owner, you hold an agent recruiting career night every month, right? And bring them in. So what do agents seek? Well, money, right? <laughs> they want a high commission split. But what else do they want? Are they worried about the brand? Is culture important to them? What about training, location, perks, growth? Which of these rank highest? How do you know? It's up to the individual, and you know that because you survey them. I know that's sort of out of the box of a lot of us to survey, but it's important to know what our customers want and how do we know if we're not out there talking to them, right? So a survey is a great way to find out agents in your company, what they like about it, what they don't like, what they like to see there. Now, as an agent, we surveyed our buyers and sellers. As a brokerage owner, now we're surveying agents. Okay, what about our success systems? We want to have onboarding, education and training, goal setting, coaches, uh, coaching, evaluate and assess our agents. So it's all about structuring the system. At the beginning we said, how can you bring on a lot of agents? You have to have the right foundation. You have to have a system set up and ready and prepared for it. So make sure that you have it and you also need a way to measure your goals and measure your agent's goals and see how you're doing. Also, I suggest having a mentoring program, a formal mentoring program for those new agents that come on that need some guidance. Most agents, as we know, go out of business within their first few years. Why? They're floundering around. They don't have guidance. But having a program, a training, mentoring, coaching program gives them a clear path from point A to point B, and you can guide them along that path intentionally and keep those agents. But the most important thing is always be recruiting, <laughs> right? Always be recruiting. Well, we get rejection, yes. It's part of the game. So what? Schedule in your calendar two days a week, two to three hour time blocks. These are my agent appointments. And you go out and recruit to your time blocks. Just like when you're an agent, you had time set aside two or three days a week when you had listing appointments. Buyer appointments, same thing. Now we're doing agent appointments. Okay, we're going to wrap it up here because we only have a few minutes. Oh, but I do want to mention one more thing about recruiting. Okay, caution. Most realtor events, including this one, are recruitment-free zones. So don't try to come and recruit agents at events like this, right? Um, you'll be booted out, <laughs> okay? But just a little word of caution there. That's why I said build business friendships. Okay. All right, so we're going to go to...
Okay, we've got about three more minutes, so we're going to go to uh, planning, being proactive versus reactive, knowing your competitors. You should actually know exactly who your top competitors are, what they're offering, and what their profitability is. How can you even begin to compete if you don't know what your competitors are offering and why other people are taking them up on there? And so that begins by knowing your market stats, knowing what's on your daily dashboard, measuring it, and strategic planning. Okay. So, and then we said it's very important to set up a system. System stands for save yourself, stress, time, Energy, money, system. Get it? Okay, system? Okay, so a system, what is it? It's a process or procedure that you can put on autopilot and it takes care of itself 80% of the time. So a system means that 80% of the time you're not having to spend time and effort because it's already going. Like your new agents, when they come on, you have an onboarding for them. You have steps that they go through, you do part of the steps, the ad, your admin assistant does the rest, and that allows you to onboard 50 to 100 new agents in a year because you have an onboarding system already set up and you're not recreating the wheel with every single agent. So you can have brokerage systems for a lot of different things, your manuals, transaction processing, your marketing, your back-end tools, um, okay, innovation. Okay, this was the topic that I just had right before this is about be the boss and dominate your market. Okay, so I want to recommend three books for you. I, I love books. I learn a lot. I keep them in my bookshelf because I refer to them frequently and read them again to get new information. But if you're not a reader, it's okay because these books are available on Audible. You can just buy them and listen in the car. You know, we're in our car driving a lot to listing appointments and things. So I like The Power of Growth by Dave and John. He gives some examples of people who started from nothing, with nothing, and were able to build into a successful business. I like the E-Myth. Michael Gerber is right on the money. He talks about working on your business instead of in your business instead of being at the technician level or the manager level, going up to the entrepreneurial level and having a big eye view of it. So that's an excellent, excellent book. He has them specifically for real estate brokerages. And then for those of us who haven't quite finished our business plan, we have successful business plans, secrets and strategies, and that's from Wanda Abrams. So excellent books there. And we have a, okay. Okay, in your book, um, towards the end, there's a, startup checklist. No, uh, at the beginning, there's a quick startup checklist for brokerages. That's for newbie brokerages, just starting. And then for established brokerages, at the very end, there's a uh, business plan outline. So hopefully that is helpful to you to be able to uh, put your business plan together. So those were our sections today. Just remember that even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. So get on the right track, but more importantly, take action and move forward, right? Okay, so today we learned about Fortune 500 concepts without the NBA price tag. Was that great or what? No, uh, it's provided for you by Triple Play, right? Thank you for Triple Play. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I am uh, pretty available. There's my phone and all that stuff, but mostly I'm on Facebook. A lot of you already know me, so you can always reach me through um, social media. Excuse me, I'm there trying to take a picture, so, okay. All right, so now we learned how to scale our brokerage, how to grow our brokerage build. We learned about the capacity, and I gave you a successful blueprint to go out there and grow your brokerage. So thank you so much for having me, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.